one thing that we can't see here is how many other times in this match that you've been in that exact same position, had a ball almost that high, and, and, and you just dinked right. it right back. So I think one thing that is tough in your game is the visual deception between taking a dink out of the air and the attack looks exactly the same until the last possible second and, and surprised him a bit there. Yeah, I think something that, that we talk about, uh, whether it's you know during educational videos or during camps, is using build-up dinks that yep. could lead to some disguise speed ups, kind of showing that same exact looks like what K-Mac had mentioned. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure in game one, I probably took a handful of dinks in that same position, probably around that same height, and I was just kind of moving the ball around and dinking it back. And then early there in game two, I took that same ball and decided to poke it, uh, poke it middle and was able to get away with murder. All right, so 3-0 here, rocking and rolling. Oh, Jame. How brave is that man, huh? <laughs> How brave is he, K Mac? All right, so looks <laughs> looks like looks like they, they put the return on me. It's a little shorter. You know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going hard. Yep. I'm trying to put a hole through through CJ. He punches the Tui. Jame hits a sexy little block off his right hip, somehow gets down. A little chicken wing. A little chicken wing. He decides to poach, get in there. I'll tell you what, the guy is brave. Well, I think and I think the brave thing is after he miss hits his little chicken wing getting jammed. <laughs> he he pokes his face in the middle. Back <laughs> and then look to reset. He stays right straddling the right. line and clocks a forehand right. off of off of Ben's forehand. Right. So very bold play, but that's what it's gonna take, you know, to beat the Johns brothers. You're looking to take risk at the right times right. and and get some of those cheap or, or, or free points to where you don't have to dink your life away. Yeah, I I, I think it just comes to show too, like um, just the vision that Jame has when the ball gets somewhat down, and he sees a he sees his, his opponent having to hit up. And if you're if you're fast, you can yep. be a great poacher if you're fully committed and you're ready to get your hands dirty. But I thought, yeah, Jame kind of hit this little you know a, a shanky block that somehow got down to a certain degree. Benny goes to take a roll volley on his sixth, floats it up a little bit. Jame stays middle and was able to uh, find some success with uh, poaching there. So um, yeah, just I think uh, for viewers and listeners out there, uh, if you want to be a great poacher, I think being fully committed makes sense, but also too, just having the vision and being explosive out of your first step and being willing to be aggressive definitely goes a long ways. Um, all right, so four zero here. Let's see if we, uh, see if we can put it in the bag. Oh, God. I think John May was thinking, Tyson, what are you doing? Why didn't you <laughs> do something with your backhand? It was floaty. Because I don't I don't trust my backhand poaches. Why? The ball did get floated up. I think I think there was a little confusion there. John May and I could probably communicate a bit better. You know, I, I, to me, I mean, the way I look at this, I, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if you did anything horribly wrong. I think it's a little bit maybe of a disadvantage of you not having a two-hander, you know, in your arsenal with the poach. Hey, Mac, I've been, I've been told that, that my whole life. You know, on the okay. side. <laughs> but, you know, I think you're still being aggressive with your court positioning. I think it's a pretty makeable drop for kind of the drive drop combo as a different way to get all the way in. And I think right. that's a ball that Jean May makes 95 out of 100 right. times. Right, for sure. Okay. Um, okay, 0 4 1 here. Put the return on CJ. Keep that man back. Speed. Ooh, ooh, look at that. Talk about. Talk about a nice hold, a nice little uh, Heisman, Heisman Trophy hold. Watch this. Okay, ball gets floated. Benny squeezed in middle. As we see, John May throws a loop in. Looks like he's going inside out. Last second, sees Ben moving. That is too freaking good, I'll tell you what. Okay, Mike, tell me, how is he able to do that? Well, all he has to do, and if you're watching in slow motion, it's easy to tell. All he has to do is hold long enough to get Ben to lean, right? He's not even moving. He's just leaning right. on his left leg, covering that inside-out dink, which is usually the play that Jaume is going to go. So once he gets Ben leaning, he knows that CJ, with that fade or wanting to play everything with a backhand counter, is going to be leaning to the outside as well, which opens up the middle. So uh, sometimes just not making up your mind too early, yeah. kind of having some options, waiting to see 
see where they shift and it's you know it's not chess at that point it's really checkers it's this or that you're usually going to have only you know two or three options total so sometimes it makes sense uh to hold a little bit longer yeah i think talk about the idea too of uh i know we kind of touched on this earlier but using those build-up dinks i would assume in game one there was plenty of balls where jame had a forehand in the middle probably had plenty of options but just decided to go an inside out dink with it and so uh, if you hit enough build-up dinks, you can start right. creating or, uh, uh, you know, presenting that surprise factor where you're able to kind of handcuff your opponents. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful hold there. Yeah, but, but just to piggyback on that, build-up dinks allow you to use your opponent's anticipation right. against them, right? What's so tough to tell in these hand battles is how much the other team is just anticipating while the, where the ball is going to be. So if you can, you know, use that against them where they're kind of subconsciously leaning because the last 10 times you've gone one way, it opens up other options. No, spot on, K-Mac. Spot on. Okay, here we go. Zero four two. See if Benny, uh, if Benny... It doesn't do a whole lot on the serve. Kind of short the box. It in. Lays it in. There's that inside out dink. Okay. And that is that is one of the few times where you will see me on the right making myself useful and showing an Ernie. I, <laughs> I, I need to start doing that more. <laughs> But no, I mean, honestly, what I see here, too, on that last ball is just some natural chemistry between you and Jaume. I think of the right-sided players, you're more comfortable playing balls on your inside foot and leaning and taking a lot of balls out of the air. But if you look at that last dink, had you not deferred to Jaume, you really only had one play where you could have lifted it right. back to the middle or back to CJ. Jaume had the option with it being his forehand, even coming a little further over, of maybe speeding up middle, maybe pulling at CJ, or an aggressive inside out dink so it made sense to defer to him because he was the player that could apply more pressure in that scenario yep yep like that okay uh 401 bang the third get in there and crash oh no what am i doing okay let jame take that one all right so <laughs> i i look to poach here fully committed take off get a look and i need to lay off that one because that is certainly not my ball <clears throat> Yeah, I think especially when you've got a partner that you know has that that closing speed and that foot speed, even if it is to the side of you, if they're in the right spot behind you, usually it's just two or three steps for them to be able to drop that ball, and then you can kind of fill into your preferred positions from there. Okay. All right, at, at, at the kitchen line here, moving some stuff around. Go, go back behind Benny. There's our little flick. Ooh, oh, he just missed it. Oh, gosh. Just missed it. Beautiful little setup there, though. Well, and, and you referenced you referenced dinking behind Ben, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's a play that that teams have started using a lot more in men's doubles this year. And it's not that you're going to get a lot of dink errors from Ben, hardly any. But by dinking behind him, it gives a ball that goes over usually. Uh, to, to Jaume, maybe it lifts up a little bit, maybe it's something he can lean on, but it forces Ben to not be clogging the middle, which makes the coverage for CJ be a little bit more and makes him a little bit more attackable. Yeah, you yeah, know, for sure. I think uh, I think people are just starting to recognize that going back behind Ben is kind of a safety zone um, just because he's having to cover, uh, you know, so much middle and cover so many balls off of CJ's inside foot so you know that he's not going to beat you with an Ernie. Right. Um, so it definitely is a is a safer zone to go to. But let's let's take a look at the initial speed up here. So go back behind Ben. Ben hits a liftier one. Jame really isn't known to take that little backhand flick out of the air, but hits it hits it well here. CJ hits a hits a scorpion. Jame Jame reloads. He's got a look. And CJ is almost on a knee, and I think John just <laughs> just overcooked it. And so, so I think this this next volley takes such uh, uh, such a high skill set. Um, I, I think some of the better counter attackers, or uh, if you were to speed up and hit a hit, hit a really good recounter with your forehand, some of the uh, little nuances or the technique cues that I see that make people so successful there is really just lodging that elbow in, keeping that thing right. short and sweet. I know we've touched on this about about my forehand. When I'm at the baseline, that's been my money maker since day one, right? It's been my best friend. But also in the same sense, from a counterattack perspective, uh, it's almost been my worst nightmare just because I tend to overhit the forehand when I'm in a hands battle. So I think being able to 
just with all the range of motion taking place with the forehand and how it's easy to get the paddle back behind you. Um, if you were to speed up and you have a recounter coming back towards that forehand or if somebody speeds up at your forehand, um, obviously kind of depends on where it's at. If it's up a little higher, it's more of a high five volley. But the trickier one is when it's around the hip right. and you really have to lodge that elbow in, kind of guide and steer it, use the pace coming at you. And if you can get any sort of top spin in that short period of time, great. But I, I just think the end goal is short and tight, lodged, lodged to the side, almost feel like there's like a rubber band tied around your body and it's kind of lodging that arm in, but probably one of the tougher counters to master. Do you, do you agree, K-Mac? Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, maybe the motion that we see Jean may use here maybe would have been slightly more effective if he's maybe one big step off the right, line. Right, right. A little bit more time to take 100%, a cut. Right. But I think when you're right on the line, one of the things I'll teach my students is you don't want to go swing, swing, right? You initiate with the first one. Maybe it's a little bit of a swing on the first one, but it's swing punch, right? You're swing thinking punch. about getting in position, right. whether forehand or backhand, getting tight, expecting that ball to come back quickly, and more just getting on top of it if you can. But the idea of taking a swing and then your recounter being another swing really really tough to have enough time uh, to time that correctly right speed and just a tad bit too much on that recounter i think i think john may was going for colin's head I, I, okay <laughs> going full bag. Uh, so i thought it was long uh and we just had that whole spiel about it going long but apparently they called it in so okay shame on us john may finds a way john may finds a way <laughs>